As we gather for worship, let us focus our mind, our hearts, and our thoughts on God. tell you that at least three or four times every Sunday, somebody says, did Ben leave? Is Ben gone? Ben is back. (laughs) Ben travels and performs in the month of October every year, right? Yeah? No? This year? Okay. Well, anyway, he's back and I'm glad that he's back. Um, Welcome. We're glad you're here with us at Klein UMC this morning. I have just a couple of quick announcements. The first is that out in the main lobby, we have our NAM bags table set up. This is um, through Northwest Assistance Ministries. We do this every year. You can pick up a bag. Uh, They are divided by gender and age. You can fill them with all sorts of toys and goodies and clothes and whatever you might want to for the Christmas season. Return them by November 27th, and we'll make sure they get back to NAM in time for distribution. The second announcement that I have is that the God Box this morning um, is shifting from Trunk or Treat, which was wonderful, and we appreciate all of your support. And our mission focus for the month of November is the Thanksgiving feast that we hold on Thanksgiving Day. So during the first um, hymn, if you want to just donate pocket change, loose bills, whatever, we have kiddos who usually run around and gather that up and um, put it in the God Box for us. And now let's worship. Will you stand?
remain standing for our call to worship. As it's Communion Sunday, our call to worship this morning is our confession and pardon. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We We have have not not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Please be seated. Weekend edition. Good morning and welcome to Klein United Methodist Church. Please use your phone to sign in with the QR code on the back of the pew or on the poster out in the lobby. If you're watching online, please use the pop-up or the link on the page to let us know that you're here. If this is your first time at Klein UMC, a special welcome to you. We have a welcome center located just outside the sanctuary doors if you have any questions or want more information on our missions and ministries. A huge thank you goes to everyone who volunteered and donated to Trunk or Treat. We handed out over 45,000 pieces of candy to well over 1,000 people. We also had a great crowd for our hot dog dinner and movie afterwards. It was an amazing day spent with our community. The Christmas Nam toy bags are here. These are bags that we fill with toys and goodies for local children for Christmas. We have 80 bags total given to us to fill as a church. Bags are due back on either November 20th or the 27th. They have gift ideas and more right at the table set up in the lobby. So stop by and pick up your bag today. Thanksgiving feast signups are online. Sign up to volunteer or sponsor various food items for the annual feast. The feast will be on Thanksgiving Day from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the Christian Life Center. We will be serving in the CLC as well as to-go plates. If you have any questions, please contact Jennifer Jordan. We've got quite a few people traveling this week, so please keep our group going to the Holy Land in your prayers, as well as our camping group that's headed out next weekend. Have a great week. The Sunday before Easter Sunday is Palm Sunday. The story we always tell that day is of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey in triumph. The people are surrounding him shouting, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. It's a beautiful story to start Holy Week as we get closer to Easter Sunday. But the story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem doesn't stop with that celebration. As he approached Jerusalem, he began to weep. He didn't weep for himself, even though he knew what was going to happen that week. He wept because he knew what would happen to others, because the people did not recognize when God came to them. He wept because he knew that there were still people who did not believe in who he was and what he could do. Jesus did so much during his time on earth, but he knew his time was coming to an end. He had healed, taught, 
loved and helped so many, but not all. There were still people who needed to be shown who he was. There are still people who don't understand who Jesus is and what Jesus can do. But that is where we come in. It is not enough for us to call ourselves Jesus believers. We are part of something bigger. We are part of this family of believers who are called to carry on Jesus' work here on earth. Jesus loved the world so much that he wept when he knew that there were people in this world that weren't saved yet. Today we celebrate All Saints Day, the day we celebrate the believers who have gone before us to heaven this year. They carried on Jesus' work throughout their lives, and now it is our turn to carry on that work. It's too important for us to stop. They knew that, and so did Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that anyone who believes in him will not die but have eternal life. Who do you need to share that with? Who can you help save? See you next week. Amen to that. Now we've come to the portion of our service where we offer our prayers. Will you join me as we pray together? God, as we come before you this morning, we come, many of us, still in grief on this All Saints Sunday. As we remember those within this community that we have lost in the last year. And each of us remember those that we have lost ourselves. God, we know that their loss leaves this aching hole within us. But we also know that we as Christians grieve differently than the rest of the world. We grieve with hope. Hope that what you have said is true, that you did save the world if we will just accept it. We also come with the grief of looking around this world and seeing the news of people killed, trampled in a party, war still raging, famine, protests that are being violently put down. God, this world needs you. We need you. And God, we ask for you to speak to our hearts today because we know that we are more than bystanders in this world. We are Christians in this world and that makes us active participants in it. Being your hands and feet, being your words, speaking truth to power, speaking truth to those who hurt, and spreading this message that it is true, that all who believe in you, all who believe in you, will never die, but have everlasting life. So God, fill our hearts this morning as we worship you, as we come closer to you, as we experience you, so that we are fed and renewed to go out again into the world, loving, offering grace, speaking truth, and spreading this message of eternal life. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Will you stand for our hymn?
You may be seated. Would the ushers please come forward? It's now time to give our tithes and our offerings. And I want to remind you that you can, of course, give here in the sanctuary in person. You can give using the QR code. You can give through mail. I also would like you all to turn around and look at the screen right up there. See that screen? It's brand new. They put it up this week. It's your generosity that enabled us to take down a 20-year-old screen and projector. <laughs> that they, they all said, yay. And I said, you are not the only one who uses that screen. I stand here and had to use that little dark screen too. So we are grateful for the kinds of generosity that you have shown that enable us to update our technology to make worship go smoother, more meaningful, and, and just take care of everyone in the room. We're grateful for that. Please pray with me. Gracious God, we are so grateful to be yours. We are grateful to be gathered here this morning. We are grateful for this church called Klein UMC. God, we ask that you would take these gifts, these offerings that you are about to receive and multiply them. Continue to grow them, God, that we might impact lives both inside these walls and outside these walls in our community. We pray all of these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
this is about Jesus and his disciples. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when, upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within the walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God coming to you. This all came about in 69 AD when Rome flattened Jerusalem. The word of God for the people of God. So as you heard, we've got some people that have gone to the Holy Land. A group of people within this church have gone, and they've taken Lawrence, our senior pastor, with them. So I figured since the two Sundays he was going to be gone, I was preaching, I would do just a small mini-series on the Holy Land. I was fortunate enough to be able to go about eight years ago or so, something like that. And so I am going to show you pictures. I promise there won't be that many of them. Just saying. And it's not going to take an hour either. Um, but just to give you an idea of what you're looking at, you need to kind of have a picture of what the Holy Land looks like. If you look at the top where it says Galilee, there's that yellowish area. That is the Galilee. And just to the right of it is the Sea of Galilee. We'll be talking about that area next week. Below that is Samaria. Samaria is where the hated group the Samaritans live. So when you traveled from Jerusalem, which is in the bottom, oh, orangey brown section, up to the Galilee, you went all the way around the blue. You would not walk through the middle of the blue because you didn't want to touch those people, talk to those people, eat with those people, nothing. They were unclean. Down in the bottom section, you can see Jerusalem. It's uh, top third quadrant on the right. It is to the left of the Dead Sea, which is on the very right of the Judea section. If you look around Jerusalem, you see a couple of smaller towns, one of which is Bethlehem. Bethlehem is only about six miles from Jerusalem. If you want to go all the way up to the Galilee, you're talking about 100 miles to the top of the Galilee. So just to give you an idea of the size and scope and where we're talking about. So the first picture I want to show you is a picture that is taken, and all of these are my pictures actually, a picture that was taken on the Mount of Olives, looking towards the Temple Mount. So if you see the, the Dome of the Rock, which is that building that has the gold dome on the top, that is a Muslim holy site now, but it is built directly on top of where the Temple holy site was back in Jesus' day. So that is the Temple Mount, and you're looking across the Kidron Valley up into Jerusalem. That is not very far away. In fact, it's under a mile to get from where I'm standing to that Temple Mount. The next picture you're going to see is the Garden of Gethsemane. So when you're standing there on the Mount of Olives, you are where the Garden of Gethsemane is. It's not very far from where we're standing. That is where Jesus prayed the night before he was crucified, when he prayed, God, if you can, take this cup from me. One of the really cool things about being in that place, in the presence of those trees, is some of them are over 2,000 years old. So you're actually standing in the presence of trees that were growing in that garden when Jesus was there. The next picture I'll show you is a picture of shopping inside the old city of Jerusalem. It is an old city, y'all. Very, very, very old. And layers have been built on top of layers on top of layers. This is a section where you're, shop you're going down this alleyway and there's shops on either side and people live up above it in the buildings up and around. It's a very tight knit close city when you're in the old city of Jerusalem. Yeah there were no cars <laughs> and so it's very much a walking city there. Inside that old section of Jerusalem is a church which is the next picture. That church is called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It would have been outside the main city walls in Jesus' day. Now it is inside the walls. But this church was built over the site where we believe Jesus was crucified. They do actually believe that this site is real. 
Like, they didn't just pick a site and build a church on top of it. This particular site has been venerated since before 70 AD. So they're pretty sure that that actually is the site where Jesus was crucified. After the Jerusalem fell in 70 AD, a pagan temple was built on this site. But then when Constantine converted to Christianity, he ordered that pagan temple destroyed. And when they excavated, they found a tomb underneath it. And Constantine had this church built on top of the site. When you go into the church, you will see this stone. It is believed that that is the stone that they laid Jesus on when they took him down from the cross. And the next thing you will see is the site of the tomb. Now, it's been built over, over the years. It's been built over many times. When I was there, they were actually doing an excavation trying to get down to the actual original tomb. But like I said, they're pretty sure that that's where Jesus was buried. And then you go to this picture, which is the Western Wall. Many of you have heard of it. It's sometimes referred to as the Wailing Wall. After the destruction of Jerusalem, This bit of wall is pretty much all that was left of the Temple Mount. And it is considered a holy site, in fact, one of the holiest sites now in Judaism, because the Temple Mount itself is Muslim-controlled, and there's very limited access up there. The Dome of the Rock, that temple is built on top of what is said to be the rock in which the world started, basically. It's the rock in which they believe Adam and Eve were made, and it is also the rock in which they believe Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice and nearly sacrificed Isaac. So it is the cradle of Judaism. So this wailing wall, this western wall, is as close as you can get to that rock, so it is the holiest site for them. And people come and pray at that wall. It's divided between men and women, Men's side's bigger, by the way, just letting you know. Um, So this is actually my hand on the left, and the hand of a woman I went to seminary with is one of my very dear friends. I went up to pray at the wall and put my hand on it and realized, that's an awesome picture, so I've snapped it real quick. But if you look, you can see bits of paper stuck into the stones on the wall. So people will write their prayers, roll them up, and put them into the wall, and that's a way of offering their prayers to God. So I want to go back to that very first picture that I showed you, that one. Standing on the Mount of Olives, looking across the Kidron Valley towards the Temple Mount. Now you might have thought it was an interesting uh, passage that I picked this morning, but I wanted to talk about Jerusalem, and the passage I picked is actually a Palm Sunday reading. Now, I would ask you, when is the last Palm Sunday you can remember anybody preaching the weeping of Jesus part and not the Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord part? I haven't, I I can't recall one to be perfectly frank. We always do the Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, I'm telling you right here, that's what Jesus was looking at on Palm Sunday. He was on the Mount of Olives. He got the colt or the donkey, went on it. He went down the Kidron Valley and up into the Temple Mount. And that's where people laid their cloaks and waved their branches and yelled, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. But our passage this morning talks about what happens when he comes into Jerusalem. Thank you, George. That's good. When he comes into Jerusalem, he cries. He cries. It says in the scripture, if you had only recognized this day the things that make for peace. I think there's a couple reasons that Jesus is crying as he enters the city on Palm Sunday. The first is the future destruction of Jerusalem. It's coming, and he knows it. You know, the Jewish people feel like things are as bad as they can possibly be. They are an occupied people. Rome occupies Jerusalem. 
and they want to be free, and they want someone who will come and lead them into freedom. That's what they think the Messiah is going to be. It's going to be David part two, because David was a mighty warrior who made Israel a mighty nation, and they were feared, and they were in control of their own destiny, and they thought the Messiah was going to come and make that true again. But you know, Jesus looks around at them and knows that this desire to fight the Romans is not going to turn out well. They do actually revolt in 66 AD, and they manage to hold Jerusalem for, many, for several years. But the Romans, man, they come, and they bring the legions with them. And in 70 AD, the Romans enter the city of Jerusalem, they killed thousands. They enslaved thousands. And they sent many into the arenas. And they take that temple and they tear it apart, brick by brick, till there's nothing left but that section of wall that you saw this morning. So imagine what this is like for a group of people for whom this has been the center of their religious life, center of their cultural life, center of everything. Their religious practice is centered around the temple. And now the temple is gone. I mean, think about it. Jesus, he's born in Bethlehem, which, which is not that far away, right? So his parents take him to the temple after he's born and dedicate him then. At 12, he's there. Left behind, but there. <laughs> and several more times in his adult life, he goes to the temple. This is the key of their faith, and it has now been destroyed. And Jesus can see it coming. But I think the second reason that he weeps that morning is his own rejection. Jesus will enter on Palm Sunday to accolades, but he will be dead in under a week. Under a week, y'all. He's been preaching a message of love and peace and grace, but the world is about to push back. So I think in both those cases, Jesus' tears are really about loss. They're about loss. The loss of the temple and all that he has known about his religion and culture. The loss of his life and the rejection of those around him. And I tell you that right now, today, <laughs> I feel those same losses. I do. I am watching... My church that I love, the United Methodist Church, divide itself, rip itself in two. So much so that a pastor that I very much admire felt it necessary at the judicial conference this week to stand up and ask the Council of Bishops to hold other bishops accountable for their actions, including a standing bishop. Y'all, this is awful. It's awful. Every week, we get visitors who come, and I think they come in the pain of what it feels like to feel the destruction of their temple. The church left them. For many of these people, they've been in church, these churches for decades. They may have been married there, baptized their children there, sent them through confirmation. Decades of worshiping at these places, and now it's loss. But we also come here this morning as part of All Saints Sunday and recognize that we have lost people too. In a moment, we are going to read the names of all of those we have lost within this congregation in the last year, and it's pretty long, and it breaks our heart. If you have people in your life that you have lost, you can put a bell out there on the tapestry hanging in the narthex in their remembrance. I've already put one there for my father. 
whose name will be read in another church this morning. Both of these bring tears. I've seen them and I've cried them myself. But I've got to tell you about the rest of the story. It doesn't end there. It has never ended there. On Friday, Jesus was crucified. And on Saturday, he's, his followers sat in a grief so profound that they never even left the upper room. But Sunday, Sunday. On Sunday, the world changed. And love and peace and grace won. Life won. So, to those of you who have come here this morning because of the destruction of your own temple, we say welcome. Come be our friends and become family with us. To those of you who come here today remembering those you have lost, we cry with you, but we also remind you about the promise of the cross, the promise of resurrection, the promise of John 3.16, that all who believe will not perish, will never perish, but have eternal life. There is hope, y'all. There is life, and it is all because of Jesus. All because of Jesus. Will you pray with me? God, as we come this morning and we remember, we ask you to hold our hearts in your hand. Those who grieve, those who are in loss, hold us and help us to feel your comforting presence around us. Both through your spirit and the spirit of those who sit here with us this morning is the beauty of, commu of community that we get to carry each other's burdens. But God, allow us not to stay there. We have been given so much more, so much more. We have eternal life, and it is all because of you. And for that, we can never say thank you enough, but we do say thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we participate in communion this morning, you will come as the ushers um, lead you. I will remind you that this, this table is an open table. It is open to anyone who would like to meet Jesus. So that means that it doesn't belong to Klein United Methodist Church, nor the United Methodist Church, but to Jesus. So if you would like to come, you are welcome here. I will remind you that George, a retired pastor of ours, will be over here at this kneeler. If you need gluten-free communion, that is where gluten-free will be. If you would like special prayer this morning, George, we'd be glad to pray with you over there. I also remind you that as we participate in communion, the communion rails are open for you to pray there as well. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Miriam and Moses, God of Joshua and Deborah, God of Ruth and David, God of the priests and of the prophets, God of Mary and Joseph, God of the apostles and the martyrs, God of our mothers and our fathers, God of our children to all generations. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you. 
And blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with all your saints, especially those who we name before you now. Jerry Ackerman. Hazel Adams. John Amon. Kathy Cathcart, Donald Crawford, Wayne Day, Peggy DeRitter, Kenneth Evans, Ruth Ann Evans, Sarah Hansen, Kathy Maurer, Lynn Mowry, Carol Perry, Rosemary Reeves, Charlie Ritchie, Marilyn Stevens, Harriet Somerville, Carson Somerville, Wayne Telling, Wanda Thompson, Nell Turner, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, strengthen us to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Will you stand for our closing hymn? Here we go. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us the place. When we all get to heaven, a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in Will the toils of life we pay when we all get to heaven? All the day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon His beauty will be. good news that yes we may lose people for a while here on earth but there is a day coming when we will all be there hallelujah that's good news if you didn't know that that's good news people need to know the good news share it in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit amen